Thank you very much. So first of all, don't be alarmed. It's not a it's not a frozen nose. It's just a rock climbing injury on my nose. So uh, yeah, so I was uh, uh, part of the Dubai London EMBA program, graduated in July 2011, and after that did what every spouse or parent that's been uh, kind of uh, bearing with you for 12 months or 18 months of you going and doing a MBA program hoping that you'll go and get a good job. I said, actually, I'm going to take a year off and climb some mountains. So, so uh, maybe at first didn't make my wife too happy, but, uh, but luckily she uh, stood by and uh, supported my project. So when I'm not wearing a suit, this is kind of what my outfit looks like, at least uh, on some of the mountains. Um, just to give you a very quick background, uh, 36 years old, uh, got an MBA with distinction, so I didn't snooze off on class. Um, lived abroad for a long time, all over the world, done business in lots of different countries. Um, my industry is basically telecom, so I've done four telecom startups uh, in various parts of the world, traveled quite a bit, um, and like to do some unusual things. I mean, lots of people run marathons today. I'm a diving instructor, I like diving with sharks, um, do some mountaineering, etc. and in June, finished the first Finnish Seven Summit. So I'm originally from Finland and, and uh, did something to basically get out of the shadow of my little brother. Uh, that, that I explained is my background for this. So I have a little brother who's three years younger than I am and uh, he happens to be a musician. And, and if you look at me, you'll very quickly guess that he's a rapper because uh, the look makes sense. But yeah, he's a, he's a very, very popular artist in Finland. And every time I meet somebody, they go, oh yeah, you're that guy's brother. And, and I just kind of, it, it gets frustrating after a while. You smile at it and then you decide I need to do something for myself. So that's a joke, but nevertheless, something that uh, I've been able to turn around, uh, at least in Finland, by, by climbing the seven summits. This is the mountains. Um, Somebody who's got a sharp eye notices that there's actually eight mountains. So um, if, if you know the history of the seven summits, they were first climbed in 1985 by Richard Bass, who's an American businessman. Um, and a year after by Reinhold Messner, who's a very famous uh, Italian mountaineer. And Messner was frustrated because um, Richard Bass had climbed uh, Mount Kosciusko in Australia, which in mountaineering terms shouldn't be really be even called a mountain. It's 2,228 meters high. You hike there over a covered path in three hours. And once you get to the top, there is families with prams, kids playing around, etc., etc. And it doesn't really feel like a real thing. So Reinhold Messner said that actually we should pick these mountains not based on the country, but based on the tectonic plates. And if we count, tectonic plates, uh, plate in Australia, then the island of Papua belongs to the Australian continent and there happens to be a very, very, or quite a tall mountain called Karsten's Pyramid, um, which is about 4,884 meters and it's actually the most technical out of the seven summits, if you decide to, to, uh, to follow his, his list of seven summits. And, and uh, I've climbed them both just to make sure that I don't have to argue with anybody which list is the right one. There's about 100 people who've climbed both lists in, in history and about 350 who've climbed either of the lists. Um, but just a few words on Karsten's Pyramid. If, you're, if you know a little bit of rock climbing and you're interested in dying, trying mountaineering um, and you'd like a little bit of a physical challenge, that's the place to go. Um, out of all these trips, it's one of my very, very favorites. You have to take a private plane that drops you in the middle of a jungle in the island of Papua, in, a, in the middle of nowhere, essentially. Um, you're met by a tribe that was discovered 60 years ago. So some of the members of the tribe, when they were born, they didn't believe that anybody existed outside the jungle. They're about this tall. Men wear no pants. They just wear a little pipe in this area. Um, <laughs> women, wear, women wear shirts and shorts, etc. And bizarrely, you get off the plane and the first person you see is wearing a Chelsea t-shirt and you just look at them <laughs> and go, this is kind of a weird experience. But anyway, so you interact with the tribe. The tribe's people, they eat some Western food, but they also like to eat spiders for lunch, uh, which we witnessed and it was kind of a weird experience. Uh, we stayed a night in the, in the village 
and they had made a little house and the house had a little decoration of uh, a tree branch with stuffed birds and all of the birds were missing their heads. And I remember everybody in my team, we kind of looked at each other and said, yep, yeah, I'm hoping we leave with our heads as well. Um, but really, really cool experience on the, on, the, on the mountain. And I remember two distinct stories of, of speaking to a village elder who was maybe in his late 60s or early 70s through a translator. And I asked the gentleman, I said, sir, how old are you? And he thought about it for a while and said, maybe 18 because he didn't have any concept of time. And then he politely asked me, you know, how old are you? And I said, I'm 35. And you could see him thinking and he goes, maybe I'm older. <laughs> may, may, maybe just a little bit. Um, and, and, and the other interesting question or, or discussion I had with him, it was, uh, what do you do with the money? Because we hired basically some of the villagers to help us carry equipment. You have to trek 100 kilometers to the jungle, to the mountain. And we, we, we got some uh, people to help us with the equipment and paid them. And I said, what do you do with the money? And he said, we buy rice. And I was nodding my head going, okay, I can get this. And, uh, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I thought, dude, you don't have pants, but you want to buy Coca-Cola. This is the weirdest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. So I don't know if, if that's a you know, great story of how brand penetrates even the deepest jungles in Papua, or if that's a terrible example of how uh, Western culture destroys some of these original cultures. So, uh, but, but those are a couple of examples of, uh, of what you encounter when you go to Karsten's Pyramid. And I have many other stories. Um, I climbed the mountain actually with my wife and she collapsed on the way back and we got locked up for two days in a local gold mine behind armed guards and eventually we were flown out of the jungle with helicopters. So there's lots of interesting stories but, but uh, we'll leave those to another day and, and today I'll, I'll try to talk to you a little bit more about Everest specifically because that's something that everybody's interested in and, and I'll try to tell you some hopefully interesting stories from the mountain, but also give you a taste of maybe what kinds of things you can take away, what kind of learnings you can take away from, from, um, from climbing a big mountain like Everest. So first, everything starts obviously with setting goals. And, and whether you're a mountaineer or not, every person has their own mountain. They all have a, some sort of a target or goal that, that um, you're interested in. And, and I've noticed on the mountains especially that nobody inherits ambition. You either are an ambitious person by birth, it's a natural part of you. you, you don't learn it in a classroom, you don't... Uh, some people need a little bit of a gentle push, but generally you either have it or not. Goals need to be challenging but realistic. Um, for Everest this is especially important because nowadays you may have seen stories that Everest is becoming quite commercial. A lot of people come in there who should not be there. They don't have enough experience. They're basically reaching way beyond their skills. And that's why very often accidents happen on the mountain. I climbed Everest in, um, in um, May and this turned into the second deadliest season in the history of Everest. 11 people died while I was on the mountain. So it's not a place to play around. Um, and in addition to the, to the 11 people, a friend of mine was flown off uh, uh, Everest base camp with a high altitude stroke, permanent brain damage, one of maybe half a dozen people. Several people returned with frostbite. One of my climbing buddies uh, lost all of his toes, um, etc. So it's a dangerous place and if you don't know what you're doing, you can put not only your life but other people's life in big danger. Readiness to make sacrifices. For, for me this meant that uh, that in order to climb mountains and, and finish my seven summits goal, I climbed five of the mountains in the last 13 months or in a period of 13 months. Um, and in order to do that, I wanted to train full time. So no work, just catering for my wife at home. And when I wasn't helping her with something, I was training. Um, and, and I think in a, in, a, in a situation like this, it's pretty obvious that you have to be passionate about what you want to do. There has to be desire, big desire, because if you don't have it, you'll just give up. Because when you climb the stairs of your 55-story apartment building for the you know, seventh time this week for four or five hours, you get bored, frustrated, etc., etc. So you've got to really want the end goal. Um, but it can't be about obsession. Obsession is something I'll come back to a little bit um, and on Everest that's something that happens to people and it's something that oftentimes has devastating consequences. Um, 
I was a little concerned um, initially about the fact that I would be taking a year off, especially when economy is going like this. But, uh, but uh, once you've taken that step and made that decision, everything sort of falls into place and you start working towards your goal and not worrying so much about what you're going to do after the project. There is a saying in my native Finland that behind every man is a powerful woman. And as you can see, it's true at least in my case. So this is my uh, wife who's British helping me train in, on the beach in Dubai. Um, she was uh, very nice in helping me train not only on the beach but on the sand dunes in Dubai, um, weighing, down the, weighing down the car tire. And I might add, she went the extra mile, got pregnant so she would be a little heavier on, in, the, in the tire. So, uh, so very, very important part of the training. Um, in terms of the preparation, I've sort of split the preparation in, into these five segments. So before you head on big mountains, you need to have the right skills. Um, you need to have right physical and mental preparation, have the right team, people around you, right tools and right attitude. <coughs> right skills, I already mentioned to somebody early on here that on Everest, a lot of people show up that shouldn't be on the mountain. People who don't quite know what to do in different situations. We had people show up in there who didn't know how to attach crampons, little um, climbing aids on, on your boots that help you uh, climb steep ice and, and snow. And you can't learn that kind of stuff while you're climbing Everest. You need to learn it before. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we practiced a little bit of uh, crossing crevasses, etc. at base camp. So this is from uh, base camp on Everest, 5,300 meter altitude. Um, and as you can see, you cross crevasses with aluminum ladders that are tied to each other. It sounds easier than it is. They're about this narrow. Um, I think the worst case this year was about three ladders tied to each other. And when a, especially a, um, a, a man steps on it because we're a little bit heavier, they'll do this. Um, and there might be 50 meters of nothing underneath you, so it's not the most comfortable feeling. Um, one of our Sherpas, uh, local Nepali guys, came to me and said, this is a piece of cake. When I came first time to, uh, to Everest, we had 13 ladders together. <laughs> and it must have gone like three meters up and down as you're taking steps. So, so this is a really critical review of, of your skills. And this picture doesn't really tell the true story because the crevasse in the picture probably continues down here. Um, so you really don't want to slip and, and lose your footing. You've got to be pretty focused and, and concentrated as you're climbing. Picture is from the Kumbu Icefall. It's the first sort of stage after Everest Base Camp, which you need to cross. Um, there's hundreds of crevasses there. At the same time, you have avalanches coming down, Cirax falling, etc. So it's generally not the most attractive environment to be going in. Um, people often say, you know, are you scared in this situation? I was scared only once because we crossed the Kumbu Icefall many times. Um, there had been a lot of avalanches on the, on the icefall. And one day we were coming actually down from camp one to, to base camp from an acclimatization hike or climb. And all the Sherpa were so concerned that they prayed for five hours straight aloud. And when the, all the guys around you are going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you're like, okay, I wasn't scared before, but now I'm starting to get a little bit concerned. So could we please stop? But fortunately, our team went through the Kumbu Icefall every time without problems. Um, but even this year, a couple of people fell into the crevasse and that was the end of their, their climb. Um, we use ropes, so we, we tie ourselves to the rope, but unfortunately ropes don't help you much if you fall in. The Kumbu Icefall, just to give you an idea, it's a huge piece of ice and snow, and it moves between 90 and 120 centimeters a day. So every day you go through it, the route is different than it was yesterday. Every, every morning very early on, a group called the Icefall Doctors take 20, 30 ladders with them and go re-navigate through the Kumbu Icefall. So it's a, it's a really challenging environment to be in in many ways. And, and as I mentioned, you need to be switched on all the time. Physical preparation, I won't waste a lot of time on this. 
physical preparation is easy. It's really easy because all you have to do is figure out what to do and then train like an animal. Um, I trained over 10 months about a thousand hours, uh, about four hours a day, uh, consisting of lots of running, um, lots of um, time in the gym, just uh, sort of muscle work because you need to climb using climbing aids, etc. So you need a little bit of stamina, uh, strength and stamina in your arms and shoulders, etc. Um, and the best exercise I found was, as I alluded earlier, I live in a 55-story apartment building. You put 35 kilos of water bottles in a backpack and go up and down for four or five hours a day. The best possible exercise. Sometimes you take two steps, three steps, sometimes you run, sometimes you walk slowly. It's excellent exercise for the mountain. But as I said, physical exercise is, is the piece of cake. Mental exercise and preparation for the mountain, far, far more difficult. And, and what I mean about mental preparation is on Everest, no matter what you do, you will encounter situations that you did not plan for. When you apply for a climbing permit for Everest, you have to fill a document, an A4 paper that says body disposal form. What would you like to be done with your body if you die at 8,000 meters, 7,000 meters, 6,500 meters, etc. And I think for many people that's the first time when you really have to start thinking about the concrete dangers of what you're doing. Um, I took a pretty practical approach to that. I thought if I'm dead, I'm dead. I don't really have a, have a big preference where I'm going to be. So I asked my wife and I asked my father. And it's the most uncomfortable conversation I've ever had with my father when you call him and say, Dad, I need help with a document. Yeah, let me know what you need. Well, if I die at uh, seven and a half kilometers, which one of these options would you like? And uh, it's a bizarre conversation, but it's part of the preparation for what could happen on the mountain. This is, a, is an actual picture that I took on, um, on our way to Camp 3. An hour before we arrived, there was an avalanche that came through. Um, a Sherpa was standing in the middle of the camp, got a big serac, big piece of ice in his shins, which broke both legs. The picture is about seven kilometers uh, altitude. Uh, and you can see the guy is probably 65 kilos and they have six people here plus two people securing them. So eight people needed to bring that 65 kilo guy down. So because the low oxygen and, and, and the immense strain on your body, little things start taking a long time high up on the mountain. <clears throat> As I mentioned, mental preparation is re really, really cr critical. You have to start with the end goal in mind, but recognize that there's no shortcut getting to the top. You have to do a lot of training. You have to be in miserable conditions on the mountain for, for, for a couple of months. Um, you have to take the time to give your body time to acclimatize, etc., etc. And by the way, if anybody wants the slides, just let me know afterwards or give me your email address and I'll, I'll email you the slides. Um, you need readiness to make sacrifices. If, you, if you're used to, too used to your comforts, um, might not be the place, best place to be because um, you don't have a lot of them nowadays. Even though I did have a classmate of mine from the executive MBA program, um, or actually, sorry, he's not a classmate, but he's a, he's a friend of mine from, uh, from the Middle East who's a Saudi prince. And he sent six duffel bags of food for himself to base camp because he didn't want to give that up and he was willing to hire people just to carry food around. So, uh, you know, different people can do different things. His father also sent him a private jet to pick him up and my dad sent me a text message saying, have a nice flight. So <laughs> we, we don't all get the same luxuries at the end. Um, you have to, you have, to uh, have positive confidence regarding your skills and what you're doing, but you can't be arrogant. On, on a mountain, if you're arrogant, the mountain will put you in your place and often with very, very devastating consequences. And I'll have a couple of examples of that later on. Um, you have to be able to recognize risks. Um, many people come on big mountains and, and think that just because I'm climbing with a guide, I just show up and the guide tells me what to do. That's not the case. I had a guide on Everest. He got sick in camp three and went down. I had a chirp on summit day. My oxygen mask broke. I had to take his. He went down and I continued by myself. So you can't rely on the fact that somebody else will fix the problem or, or make the decision when, 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 when there's a decision to be made. And also on 
on mountains, margins of error are very, very small. On Everest, on the summit day, there's, a, there's an exposed part where you're walking on a ridge that's maybe less than one meter wide. On one side, it's three kilometers to China, and on the other side, it's 2.4 kilometers to Nepal. You don't want to slip. I had, I had a friend of mine on the summit day who, in the middle of the summit day, started talking the radio and said, somebody just flew by. And then continued to walk for a few minutes and said, oh my God, somebody just died. Because of the low level of oxygen, it took him a few minutes to understand what he was actually saying himself. So he was on that ridge when somebody flew by and he was just looking at the guy going to China and he just reported it to everybody just so we'd, we would know. Somebody just flew by. And then he walks and goes, yeah, he ain't coming back. So, so it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an example of the fact that this climber had, I don't know what he was doing, he had taken himself off the rope, tried to do something, slipped and gone. We can't help them anymore. Scenario planning. Um, scenario planning is something that I've used myself. You know, I come from Finland, so we all go to the military. I did my military service in the special forces, so we use it a lot in, in trying to kind of train our mind to be ready for various kinds of situations. Um, but uh, you can't think of every situation. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I, for example, had a situation on the summit day at, at um, 8,750 meter altitude where my oxygen mask broke. And, and uh, I consider myself a pretty calm person, but the second you realize that you're not getting any oxygen from the bottle, but you're only um, breathing the air around you, which has less than 30% oxygen, panic is pretty close in hitting. And even when, uh, when I told my Sherpa that I need to take his oxygen mask, he said, I can't give this to you, otherwise I'll die. And he's looking at me and I'm going, hey, I don't have one, so I know already. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, so it's, it's, it's um, you can't prepare for everything, but we try to prepare for as many situations as possible. Especially because when we're operating in very low oxygen conditions, your brain doesn't, no matter how smart you think you are, up on the mountain, mm -mm, it does weird things to you. Um, my wife actually jokes about the fact that out of some silliness, silly desire to, to, to find out, I, 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 did, uh, I did the Mensa test before I went, uh, the IQ test before I went to the mountain, and they accepted me as a member. And when I came back, my wife said, well, be glad you went before because you wouldn't qualify anymore because you've <laughs> killed enough brain cells to, uh, to, uh, to be a little bit dumber when you come back. But uh, as I mentioned, this is part of the, the summit reach, just to give you, a, give you an image. And, and uh, this is on the way down for me. We're normally climbing this in the middle of the night in total darkness with, in our case, about 60 kilometer an hour wind and your foot is going like this as you're trying to take steps, and it's a, it can be a pretty intimidating, intimidating place to be. The other thing is right people and right team. Um, I think in sports in general, and, and maybe in some ways in companies too, people look at the person who reaches the goal or gets a medal in the Olympics or climbs to the summit of Everest or the CEO of a company and said, that guy did it. Um, but in practice, there's a lot of people that are contributing to that effort. Um, I was part of an ex IMG expedition, International Mountain Guides, which was the biggest of the season on Everest. We had about 20 climbers and we had 80 Sherpa and support personnel doing everything from preparing meals, hauling equipment, preparing camps, bringing ropes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for 20 climbers, we had, and the support team, we had 31,000 kilos of equipment, all of which was carried to base camp by a combination of the Sherpa themselves and yaks. And these two guys are our base camp managers who basically coordinate all the movement of our team on the mountain. Right tools. Uh, again, I think in, in like in business and in mountaineering, you need to have the right tools. Um, on Everest, it means that you can take certain luxuries, like you might take four pairs of underwear instead of three, uh, like you would on a, on a normal trip, etc. But it's pretty limited to what you can carry. I had about 150 pounds of equipment, um, 
but it included solar panels and laptops and satellite phones, etc. So if I look at the gear, it's maybe 120 pounds, 110 pounds, and that's what you got to live with for the entire two months that you spend on Everest. Um, and funnily enough, um, one notion that's maybe worth making is that I would argue after, after Everest that almost as important as it is to bring an ice axe and crampons and, and, and climbing harness is to bring an iPod or something like that because we also have a lot of downtime when, when it's, a, it's actually impossible to relax if you're just sitting there. So you want to do something that takes your mind off climbing and the risks on the mountain, etc., etc. Um, and, you know, music or movies or TV shows or games or whatever you do um, is very, very important. Right attitude. Um, you got to believe in what you're doing, uh, but you also got to recognize that I'm on a mountain, we're going to succeed as a team or we're going to fail as individuals. It's very, very crucial and it's, and it's, uh, it's kind of a, a, maybe a bizarre point to make or, or odd for many people, but I, I try to highlight to people that it's kind of an interesting exercise in team forming when you meet people for the first time and you know that in maybe seven or ten days you're going to literally put your hand in their, in your life in their hands. They're going to have to secure you while you're doing something on the mountain and you better build some trust pretty quickly. So, so it's an interesting exercise whole climbing mountains when it comes to sort of teamwork and team dynamics etc etc. You got to be ready to learn. Whatever you do and whatever your background is, I think everybody can learn something on the mountains um, because you encounter situations that you haven't seen in other places. Tolerance for discomfort and, and uncertainty. Um, one of the most frustrating things on Everest is the fact that you've arrived, you've trained for a year, you've arrived on the mountain, you have spent two months sleeping in the tent, going up and down the mountain, acclimatizing your body. Then you're just waiting for the summit window. And every day you get three weather reports, one morning, one midday, one evening. And every day it says, you can't go, you can't go, you can't go. And after 10 days, you're starting to get pretty frustrated. But you got to stay focused on the fact that this is the weather, I can't change the weather. On Everest, most of the year, the weather on the, on the summit is completely inhospitable. It's minus 50 or minus 60 degrees, it's 250 kilometer an hour wind. Anything above 70 kilometers an hour is almost lethal in terms, of, in terms of wind when you're climbing a mountain. So 250 kilometer an hour, totally impossible to climb. Um, this year on Everest, we had two summit windows. So two, two times when the weather was suitable for, for summiting the mountain. Um, on the 19th of uh, May, when I climbed it, it was a summit window of 48 hours. And one week later, another 48 hours. And that's it for this season. Next opportunity, next year. So you, you have to be really, really ready to get yourself on that situation of being ready to go, being patient, and then when the opportunity comes, you just have to go for it. Um, I say here, fear is a healthy feeling. Um, I think anybody who says that they don't get a little bit concerned or fearful on Everest would be lying. Um, you very quickly realize on the mountain that most of the time when you hear a helicopter sound is not good. Somebody's being evacuated for some reason. Um, as I mentioned, I had people I know evacuated um, who got injuries at base camp. They didn't go anywhere above 5,300 meters and already suffering with a high altitude stroke. Because the low level of oxygen makes your blood thicker, you develop clots and that's what happens. People break legs, trekking, they, you know, all kinds of things happen on, on base camp. You get sick. I got sick on the mountain. Almost everybody does. Um, and, and in the beginning of May, sort of eight days before we were supposed to go up first time, I had to make a decision of, I had an infection in my throat and chest. Doctor says, you're not going to get better here. You better go down. So I have to leave my team at base camp and, and descend down one and a half kilometers, stay in a village, try to get strong again, and then go back just in time before we go to the summit. So you have some big decisions to make on the mountain, but you have to kind of constantly figure out, you know, what's the right thing here for me. 
and, and, and fear is part of it, but it can never control what you're doing. High morals and ethics, this is one point I want to make, uh, because the, the downside of Everest is that there's a lot of people who go on Everest and, and a lot of people who obviously everybody who goes there wants to climb the mountain, wants to summit the mountain. And Everest gets a lot of bad PR for <coughs> terrible human behavior on the mountain. And, and what I mean by that is when you're above eight kilometer altitude, it's called the death zone. And it's called the death zone because medically your body is not living, but you're technically dying. Air cells are dying constantly as you're above 8,000 meters. Your digestion system doesn't work. Uh, your body can't burn fat, it burns muscle for energy, um, etc., etc. So it's a very ex extreme environment. And the unwritten rule in the death zone is that if somebody gets into trouble, if they can walk, you help them. If they can't walk, you help them, you, you leave them. And for me, this was one of my biggest problems before I headed to Everest because I'm the oldest in my family of three kids and I've used to looking after my younger siblings and I had had many conversations with friends and family and wife and so forth about the fact that if I would encounter somebody who is dying, I can't just walk past them and leave them there. I know it's a futile attempt for me trying to save a single, you know, single person saving a single climber, but I would rather forget about summiting and help the person and come back the next year. Um, but unfortunately, even this year, there was groups of people that I know of who, when somebody's dying in front of them on that one meter ledge, they literally walk over. Sorry, we're too busy. We'll go to the summit, we'll help you on the way back. One team had a German climber. They were coming from the north side from China. He broke his leg on Hillary step at 8,800 meters. His team left him there. And the guy just sits there waiting until the oxygen runs out and then that's the end of it. Horrible, horrible feeling. Yeah. Sometimes that you condone that or do you say that's part of the... No, I, I, I have a huge problem with it, with it. I don't accept the fact that you just leave somebody. However, I, I approach somebody, a very experienced friend of mine who's a climber, he summited Everest for the 15th time this season. It's a record for a non, non-Sherpa climber. And he explained to me that if an 80 kilo man cannot walk at 8,000 meters, you need 14 people to carry him down. So if you're there by yourself, if you're religious, you pray. If you're not, try to make the person as comfortable as possible, but you can't do anything. I mean, I tried on, on, uh, on our high camp, which is 7,900 meters. We're breathing oxygen while we're there. I went to the bathroom. I was gone for two minutes without oxygen, and it took me 25 minutes to recover from that. So if you're trying to, and that's going to the bathroom, if you're trying to carry somebody or help them walk, it's completely futile unless you have a huge group of people helping. Having said that, I still have an issue with it. And, and I've had big arguments with friends of mine who stepped over dying people. You can look them in the eye, they'll t they're telling you, help me. And somebody checks them over and says, nothing we can do. There's three of us, we can't carry you down. We can wait and see if more people show up, but that's it. We don't know if they're going to stop and help as well or if they're going to go past. So, so what I'm saying is that mountains and, and, and these kinds of extreme environments, they bring some pretty unsavory, some pretty nasty examples of how humans act also. Because you're pushed so far in the, to the limit. Another example of this was on the way down, um, after I had summited the mountain, I came to the Hillary step and there's constant flow of people coming up. And I stopped there and I wait for my turn to go down. And I stood there for 30 minutes and nobody would make space. I would say, guys, do you mind me coming down? And people would in throw insults at you and say, screw you, we're going to the summit. And you realize that, you know, it's such extreme environment that even people who you know are nice people, they're so pushed to the limit that they, they don't know what they're doing and they just want to get to the summit and that's it. 
So you have to literally push people to get down. Because nobody ain't gonna give you space in there. So it's a, it's a little bit of an odd environment in that sense. Teaches you a lot about yourself and people in general. <coughs> but then, you, so sorry, yeah. Do you need high moral or ethics or you don't? Because it says that, you know, it's okay, you know, people are pushing you at, yeah. at best. I, I would argue that you do need it. I think it, that will eventually make the mountain a better place if people actually work together and, and, and help each other. I think today people die, some people die unnecessarily on the mountain because others are not willing to help. And it's a very, very complicated subject, which has to do with the fact that the Nepalese government today does not have any requirements for guiding companies, for example. So I don't know if you're a climber or not, but you could set up a website and say, for 100,000, I'll take you to Everest. You might not have climbed ever before in your life. You don't bring robes, you don't bring, bring medical kits, etc. And then one of your clients, get, clients gets in trouble and you say, guys, somebody come and help my client, he's in trouble. And most of the big companies would say, hold on, dude, you, you charge the person 100,000. Certainly you have, a, you have a plan of what to do if the person gets in trouble. Yeah, 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 other people come and help. So it, it's a very, very complicated is issue and I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it afterwards, but uh, it's, it's one of these dilemmas of how to deal with um, on Everest. And I'll come back to some of these, these challenges related to uh, execution. So in terms of execution, five, com five components, you, teamwork, uncontrollable ele elements, risk management and, and balance. Um, as I mentioned already, right attitude is important. Um, you need to learn from your mistakes. We all make mistakes on, on Everest constantly. Um, and recognition of stress. It's kind of a weird environment when you realize that uh, after some period, some people shorter, some people longer, everybody's under a lot of mental and physical stress. You're wasted from the physical exercise. Um, as I mentioned, I, uh, I trained for, for 10 months before the Everest. Many people train longer periods of time, so we're physically in good shape. The average person dropped 10 kilos on the mountain, mostly of muscle. So you're physically drained constantly. You're mentally stressed because a lot of people are missing their family, friends, jobs, etc., etc. I had, a, I had a, a, a team member in my climbing team whose wife developed brain cancer while he was on the mountain. Can't, can't imagine much worse things than you're sitting in a tent, you call home, that's your only real comfort, and your family says, oh, mom's in the hospital and has brain cancer, a brain tumor. Wow. So lots of different kinds of, uh, kinds of uh, stresses that are impacting you. And obviously, a um, lot of people on Everest leave the mountain without actually even trying to climb the two months or 10 weeks or whatever period on the mountain is simply too long for them to handle. At some point they start thinking, this is not worth the risk. I'm uncomfortable every day, I'm wet, cold, uncomfortable. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go home. And as you see and as you have to face some of the darker sides on the mountain, people getting injured, people dying, etc., it's a hard thing to take for many people. And, and, and I think even those that stay in the mountain, it's something that stays with you forever. I see, I'm not a big person who dreams a lot of night, but I see Im images of one crevasse, for example, where a Sherpa fell in, died, and as they pulled him up, they left a, a line of blood on the side of the crevasse. And I can picture the crevasse very, very detailed in my mind. It just kind of burns into your mind the image of what happened there. Judgment is critical. You have to be able to constantly objectively look at your situation. And it's much, much harder on the mountain than you think. You have to be able to think, my guide is giving me ideas or, or suggestions, my, uh, my base camp managers or my teammates are giving me suggestions, which one of these is actually good and which one applies to me. Everest, Everest is such a big prize for many people that they do silly things. I've seen people take drugs, not normal drugs, drugs that help you perform on the mountain. 
You have no idea how they react. They might be strong one day and drop the next day. I have a friend of mine who was on Everest not only this season, but the season before, the strongest climber in his team, going into camp three, all of a sudden dropped, had a heart attack and died in front of him. Afterwards realized that the guy had been taking some sort of drugs that they weren't, weren't aware of that caused it. Maybe could, an, could have been avoided, but for many people, they're willing to break or run a lot of rules and play, break a lot of uh, sort of mental barriers just to be able to get there. The, the other thing that sort of sticks with me from the mountain is that human capacity is much, much bigger than you think. This is one of the Sherpas carrying everything, including the kitchen sink from Lukla, um, the city or little city in the, on the mountains where you fly to, which by the way is famous for being the world's most dangerous airport. Um, and from there, it's about 65 kilometers to base camp. So he carries a big load to base camp, drops it off, goes back, carries another load. Because that's how he makes some money. They're phenomenal, phenomenal people, these uh, Nepali Sherpa. <coughs> Teamwork is critical. Um, as I mentioned, we cross crevasses all the time. Um, and generally always with a partner. As you can see, there's two ropes, on e one rope on e each side of the crevasse, which are loose. And that's because the crevasse is moving all the time. It's impossible to make them, make them taut, uh, or it's not sensible to make them taut, because tomorrow morning they're either snapped or they're loose again. Uh, so you need a one climbing partner to pull them tight, and then you use them to, to climb across. Of course, the Sherpas don't think that it's manly if anybody helps you or if you clip into the rope, so they run across them to show how strong they are. And unfortunately, that's why some of them sometimes slip and consequences are pretty bad. Um, but it's a cultural thing for them. We, for example, at the beginning of our expedition, our team pitched in and we bought helmets for every one of our Sherpa. None of them used them. What? Helmets. Because there's avalanches, rock fall, etc. So we thought, you know, we're wearing shell helmets, so you guys should wear helmets too. And we don't want it to be a, a cost issue. So if you can't afford it, we'll buy you helmets. Nobody would use it. Why? Because you're weak if you wear one. But it's a cultural issue. We tried for 10 months, 10 weeks to convince the guys otherwise, but uh, it's uh, difficult when you're born in the mountain. Um, being on a climbing team on Everest is kind of like being in, a, in an MBA class in some way. So everybody's a type A personality. People are super, super competitive on the mountain. Um, but as I said, you very quickly need to recognize this thing that we need to work as a team to get to our goal. Otherwise, chances of you succeeding as an individual are pretty slim. You've got to have a positive attitude, but you also have to look after the team spirit. There is, I guarantee, Every person on the mountain is going to have good days and bad days. And when you're having good days, it's your job to look after the guys who are maybe not having such a great day and, and you'll get the favor in return on another day. Um, you've got to trust, trust each other, build that trust and constantly think about how can I help the team to succeed? What can I do today to, to, to make sure that we succeed as a team? One of the challenging things is these uncontro un uncontrollable elements. So this is from Kumbu Icefall. Um, and you can see an avalanche coming down in the picture. Um, they won't warn out of themselves. There's no dangerous music coming out like in TV programs. It just comes all of a sudden. Um, luckily, we weren't there when they came down um, in bad ways. I remember, however, when we left for our summit push uh, in the middle of the night from, from base camp um, and we're climbing in total darkness with only the light of our, our uh, headlamps, we could hear an avalanche coming down and a big, big, big no noise. And then you can start feeling snow and ice getting hit in your face and you just hope or pray, whatever, that it's not going to hit you. And luckily the avalanche stopped before it hit us. But, but you're oftentimes in environments where you have to recognize that I can't control everything that happens in here. There is risks that I cannot minimize. Well, I can minimize them, but I can't make them go away completely. 
So like markets or customers, you know, mountains are unpredictable. Um, patience is a huge thing. If, if you're the kind of person that wants to come in and get there quickly, again, sorry, not the right place. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day whether you climb the mountain in the first summit window or in the second summit window, in the beginning of the window, at the end of the window. If you summit the mountain, it's a pretty successful thing to start with. So you need to be pretty, pretty patient. And right timing, just like in life in general or in business, you know, every company might have right timing to introduce new ideas or get new customers or whatever. On the mountain, it's crucial. You got to get your timing right. Um, and recognize that a successful expedition always requires a little bit of luck. Like I said, I got sick on the mountain, but I was able to get rid of the, the illness just before we went up the mountain. I had another teammate who got sick in the middle of our summit attempt. Had to turn around, no chance. So it's a little bit about luck as well. I talked about this a little bit earlier. So this is what used to be our camp three. Avalanche came through and this is one tent or what's left of it um, on the mountain. This is on the Lotsi face. Um, somewhere in the middle there in the valley is our camp two. And you go up the Lotsi face about one kilometer um, wall and uh, you're camped on, a, on little ledges on the, on, on, the, on the Lotsi face. And when avalanche comes, the avalanche comes. You can't do anything about it. So again, example of these uncontrollable elements. I won't uh, talk too much about that. Um, but uh, again, positive attitude, you have to, uh, you know, not assume things, not guess things, but get the facts straight, find out what the weather is going to be like, try to identify risks, etc., and think about what you're going to do in, in different situations. <clears throat> we had, for example, a, a situation when we were making our summit push. So once you leave from the base camp at 5,300 meters, it's about seven days to the top and back. And we had gone from base camp to, via camp one and camp two to camp three, which is at 7,400 meters and uh, one of my teammates said, look, I have weird feeling in my lungs. So I don't know what it is. I can't, it doesn't feel like an infection, but it feels like something weird. So I'm just going to go down and find out what it is. He went down to base camp, doctor checked him out. Um, he had a, he had an oedema and the doctor said you would have probably died if you had gone the other way. The guy says, obviously, now he preaches how it was a great decision, great decision making, but he admits that it was a little bit luck too. It's a 50-50 decision. He chose the right 50. Balance, as I mentioned, it's physically and mentally really, really tough to be on the mountain. So balance is an important thing. This is our Sherpas just chilling out in the sun at uh, Camp 2 at 6,500 meters. Um, we have a lot of downtime. When you're on a mountain, you might sleep 10 to 12 hours a day because of the, of the physical and mental stress. And even then, if you're not sleeping, you're eating or climbing. Those three things or, or, or resting some other way. Um, so uh, we spend a lot of time in the sun or in our tents just trying to chill out and, uh, and gather energy for the next, next day's push. Um, I don't look very happy in the picture. Um, it has to do with the fact that uh, when we uh, headed over to the summit, the last weather report said it's going to be minus 20 degrees and no wind, which was great news because as I'm originally from Finland, I'm used to, you know, minus 30 degrees in the, in the winter, etc. So it was supposed to be a piece of cake. Um, it turned out to be minus 40 degrees and 60 kilometer an hour wind. Um, and I've never on any expedition been worried about frostbite. But here I was seriously, seriously concerned that I would get frostbite in my hands or feet. I had, we had a little bit of a problem coming from camp three to camp four. Um, we hit a huge, huge traffic jam. Um, if you can imagine climbing somewhere at almost eight kilometer altitude, coming out of your tent and there's 250 people in the rope that you're going to use to get to the next place. That's what we encountered. 
Um, and I got frustrated because that slowed our pro process down completely. And when we left from Camp 4 or got to Camp 4, I already told our guys that I'm going to leave at 8 o'clock in the evening. I don't care if anybody else is going, I'm going with my Sherpa because I want to be at the beginning of the queue, not at the end of the queue. Because then the queue, I get to control my pace rather than the queue controlling it. So I climbed in the middle of the night, was among the first people to reach the summit, but temperature is pretty terrible and I had my oxygen system broke down three times on the summit push. Um, so it's pretty, pretty uh, difficult situation to start with. And, um, and uh, then when the weather gets tricky, etc., you're pretty wasted. Although I still consider that I was in pretty good condition on the summit, but, but I'm sure some other people would disagree with me. Um, one of my teammates, I had a conversation with him for 10 minutes on the summit. He has no recollection that he's met anybody on the summit. He would stand here and say, oh, I was on the summit by myself, the sun was rising, blah, blah, blah. And then I would put a picture of him and me talking on the summit and go, what about this? And he goes, hmm, don't remember you being there. So the oxygen impacts you. On, um, on Everest, on the summit day, the average person burns between 12 and 15,000 calories a day. So that equals, if anybody's a runner, that equals to running four marathons back to back in terms of the physical, physical strain. Um, and, uh, and the normal summit day lasts anywhere between sort of 20, 12 to 24 hours. My round trip was 13 hours to the summit and back. Um, many of my teammates took 25 hours. And just to explain how slow that is, the distance is 1.7 kilometers, 1.1 miles. So if you're fast, you're moving 200 meters an hour. If you're slow, you move 75, 80 meters an hour. That's how difficult moving at high altitude is. In practice, you're taking a few steps, you're totally out of breath, you try to catch your breath, you can't, but a little bit stabilize it, then you continue again for a few steps, you stop again, it's kind of like a turtle race. And, and uh, what we're doing is we're using oxygen. Occasionally, I have, a, I have a friend of mine in Finland who's climbed the mountain without oxygen. That's absolutely insane. Yeah. They spend a lot more time on the mountain acclimatizing letting their body get used to the fact that on the summit, less than 30% of oxygen you have here. So if you, ox if you breathe here once, on the summit you have to do maybe three and a half times. This season there was nobody on Everest who tried to climb it without oxygen. And the oxygen we use is, is, is important to highlight is supplementary oxygen. So if anybody's a diver, that's not what we do. We're not, di we're not breathing only oxygen because it's too much. We would require, I don't know, 15 bottles of oxygen, 20 bottles of oxygen. So because the weight is limited, we're mixing the oxygen from the bottle with the oxygen around us. Depending on the strength of the climber in different, uh, different kinds of mixes. I used about three liters a minute uh, and used about three bottles all together during the summit push. Each bottle is seven and a half kilos or 7.4 kilos. So you don't want to have much more than three bottles with you. Um, but I know people who on Everest use six or seven bottles of oxygen because they physically it's too hard for them. So they need more oxygen. And then somebody keeps running up and down bringing oxygen bottles. <laughs> you can do everything on Everest nowadays if you want to. <coughs> I saw a couple, um, this season, which is kind of like what I didn't want to see. They had hired a private guide. Um, they had paid for Sherpas to carry private, uh, private uh, toilets, showers, etc., to the different camps, lower up on the mountain though. And uh, they used, I think, seven bottles of oxygen on the summit day. So they had a guide, two Sherpa, and a couple of other Sherpas just running up and down with oxygen bottles so that they could have enough oxygen to get to the summit and back. Again, an example of what should not happen, but unfortunately nowadays, if you have money, you're going to find somebody who's, I don't know, foolish enough or ready to take the money from you. It happens in business all the time nowadays. Yeah. 
un unfortunately, unfortunately. And, and I describe it in a way that a mountain like Everest today attracts two types of people. It attracts mountaineers who are there because of the challenge of climbing the mountain and it, it, um, it attracts high altitude tourists, mostly wealthy people who want to get an experience. They're not interested in learning the ropes in smaller mountains. They want to go to a cocktail party and say, guess what? I just climbed Everest. I'm a cool guy. Um, the, the profile of a person who climbs Everest is maybe um, different than many people think. So in my team this season, um, out of the 20 climbers with IMG, we had two teams. We had eight people in my team and 12 people in another team. The eight people, the average age was 47. We had two women and six, six men. Youngest was 28, prince from Saudi Arabia who sent six duffel bags of, uh, of food uh, and flew out with a, with a private jet. Not that I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you know, he's a good friend of mine, so we joke about it all the time. And the, and the oldest guy in my team turned 60 while he was on the mountain. So the scale is quite, quite huge. Um, the 60-year-old, in our case, didn't get to the top. We had people who were competitive triathlonists who didn't get to the top. So it, there's a lot of variables when you're climbing Everest. Just because you're in good physical shape doesn't guarantee you get anywhere. I've had people on smaller mountains who are physically very fit and at 4,200 meters get altitude sickness and their climbing career is over right there. So it's, some of it is, is in your DNA, some of it is in your training, and a lot of it is right here. It's how much you're able to push yourself when you feel like you have nothing left. Um, but uh, in our case, the, the interesting fact, at least for the ladies in here, is that on mountains like Everest, women generally have much higher success rates than men. Because women are better at listening to somebody giving them advice, and they're better at listening to themselves and their own bodies and, and what's happening, etc. Men, we suffer a little bit from, you know, trying to be cool and tough and we they make stupid things. I have, a, I have a climbing partner, the guy who uh, was on the summit with me, doesn't remember talking to me, but uh, I, we've looked at the pictures afterwards. Um, when we descended from the summit um, at different paces, um, I met him again in camp two at 6,500 meters and his first comment to me was, I, I haven't felt my toes for two days. And I said, dude, we got to take your boots off and see what happens. And, uh, um, and um, unfortunately, he had bad frostbite in his toes. One finger and all of his toes in one, one foot we're, we're in frostbite and we started treatment on it right away. Um, we got a helicopter evacuation for the guy the next morning, but we saved his finger, but he lost his toes. Why? The guy's an ultramarathonist and his whole mantra is that the only way to do well in ultramarathon is to push the pain aside, ignore the pain. But he didn't think about the fact that when you're on a mountain, this ain't pain in your muscles in your feet. If something starts hurting, there's a reason why it's hurting or stops hurting after a while. You know, you need to check on it. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, apart from having bad toenails, uh, this is a guy who's a guide. And this is good frostbite. So this is one where the guy kept his toes. The bad case was the guy's foot was black all the way here. The worst thing with frostbite is that it can, they, we can start treatment right away, but it won't heal right away. And, and my friend who lost his toes, he returned home to the US in end of May. He got treatment until first week of September, and then they cut him off. Because the doctors need to give the nerve endings time to heal, etc., to avoid shadow pains. So basically, if you freeze your fingers, and you cut them off too fast, you feel pain here. You know you don't have a finger there, but you can feel that it hurts right here. It's a bizarre thing, but that's how human bodies work. But this guy worked around with black toes for three months and get to, got to keep them. 
So this is an example of the fact that both of these guys actually push themselves a little bit too far. The price of their success of getting to the summit was too high. Because I don't think it's worth anybody losing their toes or fingers or anything else just to get to the top of the mountain. They got to go back and think about what they're going to do. Um, and you know, you don't do a lot of running after you've lost your toes. <coughs> so I, I, I took the London Business School flag actually all the way to the summit. I wanted to show you guys a picture of the flag in the summit, but because of the wind is so bad, I only have pictures where my face is totally contorted and the flag is upside down and twisted, etc. But, uh, but nevertheless, the flag made its way to the, to the summit. Uh, this is from the base camp about 36 hours after summiting. Um, and I handed the flag back to uh, the school. The dean took it and, and, and promised to put it up somewhere in the school. Uh, so uh, if you see it, you'll know where it's from. But, uh, but it, it was kind of a, actually a funny thing because I had kept the flag in my, in my uh, down suit and not told anybody about it. Because um, I thought, you know, I don't know how people are going to react me starting to pull out all kinds of flags out of my pockets. But you get to the summit and that's what people do. One of my climbing partners, she looks around and goes, oh, can you take me a picture? New York University, next flag, do do do. And I felt so much better because I started doing the same thing, the Finnish flag, here's London Business School, because you want to take most out of that moment. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a little bit of a, a, a funny incident of, a, a, a friend of mine said that I actually had the wrong approach because when he climbed Everest, he took a white board with him. And he holds the white board on the summit. And after that, he superimposes company logos on it and says, there you go, I took your picture to the summit. So he clearly figured out how to do this. <laughs> how do you take a picture on the summit? <laughs> do you take your gloves off? Yeah. Wow. For a very short period. And, and I, I actually carried a, um, I carried a, a big camera with me. Uh, if anybody's a, a, a camera interested in cameras, so I carried a Nikon D7000, um, which is kind of like a semi-professional camera, DSLR, big, weighs three and a half kilos or three kilos with the lens. Um, so I carried that all the way to the summit and people thought I was a little bit crazy, but pictures turn out pretty nice, many of them. So, yeah, so, it, it, and, and there's a lot more that, you know, can't stuff them all in here, but, but uh, they turn out nice. and and uh, people bite their lip. I mean, you can see in the picture here, I'm not taking ox oxygen either. And after maybe just one or two minutes, you start feeling a little bit woozy and headache hits you right away, etc. And that's the real problem. I mean, if, if you told me that I have to go to minus 40 degrees at sea level, no problems. I can take my ha gloves off and be like that for a couple of minutes. Not more than that, but a couple of minutes. But when you're an Everest, and there's 30% or less than 30% of oxygen, then it's a problem. Because the way the human body works is that when what we do in the process of climbing up and down the mountain, we're acclimatizing, we're basically telling our body to produce more red blood cells to carry oxygen around. Um, and that's what the body, so body compensates by doing that. That's why athletes do high altitude training. Their body carries more oxygen and hence they're stronger. Um, but when the level of oxygen is not sufficient, the first thing the body stops is extremities. So blood no, uh, red blood cells no longer carry so much oxygen to your hands and feet. And that's why they freeze. Not because you take your gloves off. They maybe contribute to that, but that's not the ultimate reason. Body tries to make sure that your, your, uh, your organs have most of the oxygen and brain works, etc., etc. But it's a, for me, um, it's, been a, it's been a phenomenal experience. So over a period of 13 months, six months on the mountains, uh, my wife is very happy because when I came home, um, not, not, not only because I gave her peace and quiet for six months, but I, I appreciate little things a lot more. Bed, taking showers every day, being able to walk to the fridge, take some food or drinks out of it, it's huge because you've just spent literally months not doing that. Um, 
you, you learn a lot about yourself, you recognize that actually most of the things that we, we worry about every day are pretty petty. Um, and, and you learn to, I mean, there's the, as I talked about earlier, the sort of the darker, the sadder side. So um, I was, I spent November in Antarctica, most of it. It was a great trip. Um, December in Aconcagua in, in Argentina. Um, just me and a, me and another climber, so just two of us. About three, four people died while I was on the mountain. Then Everest, 11 people die. I had, after Everest, I had an eight day break, went to Alaska, to Denali. Um, our first night on the mountain, somebody comes to our tent and says, a Japanese guy, and said, can I borrow a satellite phone? And we said, where's your team? And he said, we got hit by an avalanche and they're all dead. So it, it forces you to, to kind of face these kinds of situations which are quite hard. And you appreciate the fact that, you know, you have to enjoy every life and every moment and, and so forth and not, uh, not take anything for granted because, for example, these Japanese climbers, they got hit by an avalanche in a place where there has not been an avalanche in 20 years. They did everything right. Nobody made a mistake. Nobody did anything stupid. They did what everybody else did. They were just there at the wrong time. And on the way back, um, on Denali, um, we don't have Sherpas, obviously, in, in Alaska, so we have to carry all of our kit with us, which means that you carry maybe 30 kilos on a backpack or 35 kilos, and then you pull maybe 50 kilos on a sled behind you, <clears throat> which on a flat ground is pretty easy, um, and on an even slope is also relatively easy. But you have places on, on the mountain, for example, where you have to traverse. And it's the most uncomfortable thing when you're on a narrow ledge, um, and it goes down for a few hundred meters, wind is blowing, and your sled is dragging you out all the time. It's a very, very sort of uncomfortable environment. And on the way down, we were in a situation like this, and, and uh, there was a crevasse, and I obviously avoided the crevasse, but my sled went into the crevasse. And now it has nothing but emptiness outside, so it starts yanking you into the crevasse. And, and, uh, my wife said it's because I was a little bit chubby that I was able to keep myself from falling in. But after me, there was a British guy who was smaller built, wasn't ready. Uh, sled pulled him into the, uh, into the crevasse and broke his neck before anybody could stop him. So the margin of error is super, super small in many of these mountains. And a lot of it has to do with luck. A lot of it has to do with recognizing these dangers in advance. But, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to also accept the fact that I'm not in control of everything. And, and many people think that people who climb big mountains, etc., that we somehow seek dangers or enjoy that. Um, but I would argue with people that it's completely the co opposite. Every person I know that climbs mountain wants to minimize all the risks involved. We recognize that the risks are there. We recognize that we can't get rid of all of them but we certainly want to minimize as many of them as, as possible. We just enjoyed the challenge of pushing ourselves and pushing our team in, in, in getting to the top of Everest, etc., and, and all the training and, and uh, preparation and the climb itself um, and what's involved with it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging environment. And you know that, like in life in general, you're not, you're not in co control of everything. So. Hopefully you guys get something out of it. I'm happy to answer more questions. <coughs> yes, I think we have time for questions if people have them. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it to you to sure. stop it when you want, really. Sure. Yeah, I have a quick one. Uh, why do you do this and what are you doing afterwards? What's the next? Well, yeah, so very good question. So uh, as, a, as a person, I've always been somebody who likes to test, uh, test my limits a little bit, whether it's it work or projects or personal projects like this. So, so that's really what drives me to get there is to, is to push what, I, what I'm capable of doing. And I think that's what attracts many people to mountains. The, the downside of that is, is many experienced mountaineers um, often say that we hope you never find an answer to that question of where my limits are. Because on the mountain, oftentimes recognizing it causes something, something bad happens. Um, whether you 
freeze something or you slip and fall, etc., etc., the, the outcome can be pretty bad. So I like to test my limits and, and it's not just mountaineering. Um, I'm actually trying to put together an expedition for next year, so a year from now, to do some first ascents on Antarctica, climb mountains that have never been climbed before. Um, unfortunately, rather expensive projects. Just a single person flying onto Antarctica is about $25,000. So I need to find a company to sponsor that. So if anybody has an idea, let me know. Um, the, be the benefit is that you get to name the mountain. So, you know, I've told a few friends that if your company wants to sponsor, I'll name them after you. Um, and, and I'm interested in skiing to South and North Poles. It's two months each way. South Pole is, is relatively easy. It's just skiing for two months. Um, North Pole, the, the problem is that you're not on solid ground, um, but you're on pieces of floating pieces of ice. So in between skiing, you have to put a floating suit on, jump into the water, swim across in the worst case, climb up again, take it off and ski some more. Um, and if you're not moving fast enough, you will be when the polar bears are chasing you. So, you know, there's some, there's some unique challenges in there. Um, but uh, but the, other thing, the other thing for me is that um, um, on the day I met my climbing team in Kathmandu, um, my wife called me and said, you know, good luck on the mountain. And by the way, went to the doctor, I'm pregnant. So, so it was one of those moments for me on the mountain where I had to go, wow, I don't know if this is like the best possible timing or the worst possible timing for me to be on the mountain. But, but having the conversation with my wife, she, she's a climber too. So she said, you know, I know it's important to you and et cetera. So you go climb the mountain, get back safely. She said, I trust your judgment on the mountain. So, so come back and then we'll, we'll do this. So my wife is due in three weeks now. So uh, I managed to get the project out back with all fingers and toes. So uh, that's, I guess, the next big project. Um, I would say that this is probably without exaggerating the best event I've been to the last two months I've been at LBS. Thank you. Um, in some ways I, I feel like, you know, why are you not in London Parks and we have to hear other people probably not even come close to, to your... Well, it, it's different kinds of experiences. I appreciate the comment. I mean, I, I'm doing a little bit of speaking now in the Middle East and I've done... I, I just uh, was yesterday at Arsenal Football Club doing some stuff with them and I'm going back to them on Saturday. So, you know, there are entities that recognize what learnings they can take out of, out of uh, a project like this. Um, and I think once you have a business background, it's easier for you to kind of pull some examples out of it. And, and I'm convinced and I've told many people and many companies when I've spoken to them that this kind of pro project is not only interesting for me as a climber, but I can actually take a huge amount of things from here and apply them to business. When I work as part of a team or when I set goals, etc., there's a lot of things that resonate and, and, uh, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of examples from the mountains that people can, even if they're not climbers themselves, they understand what that means and, and, uh, and it's easier to get messages across that way. Right. So uh, it's a, like, you know, what was, uh, I'm like a wannabe climber. Mm -hmm. you know, I've made a commitment to my wife that you know I'll get in shape and we'll, we'll go for uh, you know my sort of my trip to Manjaro. Yeah. Just your uh, quick uh, sort of uh, uh, ideas on like how should I spend the next two months preparing myself. Um, well, Kilimanjaro is a good place to climb. So I've uh, and and I have a specific recommendation for you. So I've climbed Kilimanjaro a couple of times. Uh, at the time, it felt challenging. And it is a challenging mountain. Actually, if you, if you trust the statistics from the Tanzanian government, 30% of people who buy a, buy a permit summit the mountain. And it's because a lot of people think that pff, six kilometer mountain, five days up, this is a piece of cake. I can do this without any problems. A lot of people get altitude sickness on, on, uh, on, um, on Kilimanjaro. And if it's the first time, it can be a little bit of a problem because you don't know really what um, what kind of fee what the feelings are going to be like and what you should do about it um, but if you go through go and climb with people first of all who've maybe been there before or or um, have climbed more that reduces your risk second thing is is on a mountain every time you have a problem even if it's the tiniest of headaches you tell somebody because if you all of a sudden drop 
Nobody has any idea what's happened to you. There is no ER to take you, so somebody there has to be able to do something to you. Um, and, and, you know, lots of people get hit with problems. I had the, the Saudi friend of mine on the summit day, he was so convinced that he was not coming back that he called all of us on the radio and said, guys, I made it to the summit and I don't think I'm going to come back. Nice knowing you people. And his Sherpa literally took his medicines out of his pocket, stuffed some in his mouth and put some water after it and said, we're going down, come on. And the guy returned. And today he's a big hero in Saudi Arabia. But, uh, but you know, people are really, really pushed to the limit. But in terms of the, and, and to answer your question, so I have one comment before that. Six months after I met my wife, we climbed Kilimanjaro together. She said that the thing that attracted her to me was not my George Clooney-like looks, but it was the fact that I was a mountaineer. Yeah, jokes aside. That I was a mountaineer and, and we climbed ever and we climbed Kilimanjaro together six months after meeting. In hindsight, I think it's the greatest thing you can do with a with a, either a friend or somebody you're dating or married to, because you learn so much about the other person in those days. It, it'll take you years to learn otherwise. Because you're physically and mentally stressed, you're in uncomfortable situations. You know, my wife says with great horror, and since she's not here, I can, I can tell this story. Um, she got altitude sickness a little bit on, on Kilimanjaro. And, you know, she's of Indian heritage. So she's very, you know, what you can do and what you can't do, et cetera, et cetera, and what a husband should see and not. And she goes, I have huge diarrhea. <laughs> and we're on a mountain. I said, well, you got to go, you got to go. And she's like, but there's not a bush in sight. I mean, there's no rocks. What am I going to do? There's all these guys walking around. And because you're climbing as part of a team, everybody stops. What are we doing? And I'm like, we have a situation. Just check out that view over there. <laughs> Held my jacket. She did her thing. And we continue. But it, but, it, but it forces you to sort of expose yourself for the person you are. And, and, and you really learn about your, each other a lot. And, and, uh, and I think on Everest, I also learned that, you know, it's what you, it's the experiences you go through with another person that teach you about them and you, not how long you've known them. I have friends from my childhood, people I've known for 25 or 30 years. I have closer friends that I've known for two months, but the two months I spent with them on Everest. I've seen them on a good day, I've seen them on a bad day. We've had to talk about everything from somebody's spouse having a, having a brain tumor to having kids to dying, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because you're pushed to that extreme limit. So you learn a lot about each other. But, but coming back to Kilimanjaro, it's all about endurance. Running, not the greatest of exercises, as boring as it sounds, Find some stairs, the higher they are, the better, or heels. Put some weight on your backpack and go up and down. That's the best single exercise you can do. The other thing is to, to take care of the little practicalities on a mountain. When you're there for the first time, it's very easy to say, uh, I've had a Mars bar in my pocket the whole day. It looks disgusting. I don't want to eat it. I'll just wait until the camp and eat. Big mistake. You have to eat constantly. You have to drink constantly. On a mountain like Aconcagua in Argentina, which is about seven kilometers high, you have to drink about seven liters a day to stay hydrated. If you don't drink seven liters a day, you start getting weaker and weaker and weaker. That's the only mountain out of the seven that I've had to do twice. Because the first time I didn't drink enough, body gets weak, your resistance to fight infections and bacteria weakens. I got uh, throat and chest infection and that's it game over. I tried to climb. You're totally wasted. I lost six kilos, I think, in a couple of days. Can't do anything. And when you're in high altitude, your body can't find bugs the way it can fight things here. So it's a combination of a lot of things. You have to prepare well physically, and then you have to be really diligent in what you do on the mountain. Look after hygiene. It's typically a huge problem on the mountain. It's very easy when you're on Kilimanjaro in a camp that gets used by 100 people a night. 
you're, you're picking something up on the ground, then you eat with your hands, go to the bathroom, you don't wash your hands, it's very easy to get sick. So, so it's crucial that you follow, you know, try to maintain hygiene and it's, it's crucial that, uh, that you follow the advice of maybe the more experienced climbers in there about listening to your body, highlighting if you have a problem, making sure you eat and drink constantly. Everything else is piece of cake. Cool. When you Well, he was more than okay. These guys are, in my book, they're the supermen of the mountains. So my Sherpa went down from 8,650 meters without oxygen, was part of two rescues, and then I came down. He, he went, no, he went down to the camp, take, took some oxygen, went up, saved somebody, came back, took some more oxygen, went up, saved another guy, and then was waiting for me there and said, how was the summit? There's, there's really, really phenomenal guys. Everybody's very small built and, and medically they've been tested a lot and, and doctors have concluded that their bodies carry more oxygen. They have more red blood cells than we can and they uh, are able to recover a lot faster than we are. We, we, we can. Um, the downside is this sort of cultural problem. So when we went on the summit push, for example, I went to my Sherpa and said, you know, do you have enough water with you? And he had a half a liter Coke bottle filled with water and said, yeah, yeah, no problem. No food, half a liter. And when we got back from the summit, I said, you have water, same bottle, still full. Because weakness to drink something. And I've been drinking four liters or something and I'm still thirsty. So, but sorry, you were asking something else. Oh, well, I, no, I was just wondering because I thought you said that when he gave you this mask, yeah. He, he was concerned. He was concerned. So but I was wondering uh, if, you're, if then during your ascent, if kind of concern for him at all affected you? Not so much on the descent because he got down pretty fast and I got the radio call that he was at the camp and okay, etc. So we are today, um, most big teams don't use cutoff times on Everest anymore. So in the, you may have seen it on movies or TV that in the past it used to be like, you know, dangerous sounding music and a guide would come in and say if you're not in the summit by one o'clock you have to turn around otherwise you're not going to make it. <clears throat> Instead our base camp managers they use a huge chart where they have maybe 15 spots on the mountain on the summit route and everybody's name and they will mark times every time you hit a po point and they'll calculate your speed and they have enough data to tell you that if they can see that you're too slow in the first cutoff point, they'll already turn you around. I had guys in my team who they got to the first cutoff point and the base camp manager is already saying, you got to go double the speed, otherwise we're going to turn you around right away. Um, but, um, it, it, you know, I'm, I was happy, I was happy that my, my Sherpa made it and, and uh, he's a phenomenal guy and, and even though there's, you know, big difference in our lives and cultures, etc. But I'll remember him for the rest of my life because he effectively, it was his job, but he still, he sacrificed his summit in order for me to go. And, and that's pretty big for me in, in that situation. So I have great appreciation for that. Will you do it again? Everest? Yeah. Any plans in the future? Not well, my wife wants to climb it. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I have to, if it's in the near future, I have to look after the, the baby, but uh, I'd rather be there when my wife climbs it in order to, uh, I guess I have that big brother feeling still because of my childhood of, you know, wanting to make sure that everything's okay, etc. So uh, who knows? But, it, but it's, 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 a, it's a weird place. I mean, I'm also convinced, which is related to your question, that because of the number of people on Everest, because of the decreasing level of ex experience for the average climber and because you have a lot of new outfits looking to make money rather than create a safe expedition that Everest is kind of poised for this perfect storm. I had a couple of guides who came back from the summit that I know and the first comment was that we were this close of 100 people dying. 
the weather was so horrible that it didn't need to be much worse. And we had a couple of incidents where there were so many people on a safety rope that they literally pulled it off the ice. And one, one of my friends, for example, he was hooked on a rope and fell five meters when the rope came off. And obviously survived the fall, but you know, these kinds of moments of, wow. Same thing for us, you know, when we went from camp three to camp four and there's 250 people on the same line that goes straight up on the same rope. It's moving very slowly, you're kind of bored, everybody starts taking pictures, drinking, etc. And the next thing somebody yells is, watch out. You look up and you move your head like this because somebody just dropped the camera. And when it falls 300 meters and it hits you in the head, that's it. I had cameras fall down, not from me, but from, I had to avoid cameras, water bo full of water bottles, a couple of oxygen tanks. Yeah, I remember seeing those pictures. Uh, it was a big, like, I think uh, the two windows that you're talking yeah. about was when there was a big traffic jam. I yeah. think it got a lot of coverage after yeah. that because uh, a lot of people died, like this. Yeah. 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 And, and, and on the mountains, I think, if I can make one more point is that picking the right team is just as important as in being successful in business. So I picked a, a, a company that I had used before. I have climbed with the guide before in other mountains, so we know how, I know what his capabilities are. He knows what my capabilities are. They're well organized. They got good safety records, etc. I had another friend who climbed for, on a shoestring. He picked the cheapest trip he could find coming from China out of 10 people in his team, three died. So I just use it as an example to say that if you try to save a buck in the wrong place, you know, the result can be pretty bad. And I had promised my, myself, my wife, my parents that when it comes to safety, no cutting corners. I can live without that private jet going home, but when it comes to safety, you know, no, no shortcuts on the mountain. Um, and, and it's pretty well organized. I mean, it's a, there, is a, there is a volunteer um, doctor at base camp throughout the season. Um, literally every climber goes there a couple of times. You get a cough, you get infections, etc., etc. So you need that. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of good things being organized on Everest, but uh, it's getting to be very, very busy. As I said, 900 tents at base camp on the south side this season, maybe 200 on the north side. It's huge. But having said that, when Edmund Hillary, uh, Sir Hillary, Edmund Hillary uh, climbed Everest in 53, he had a thousand people in his expedition. Because in true British military fashion, they had to carry wooden tables and big chairs, etc., so the officers could feel comfortable when they're on the mountain. So mine was only 110 people, so it's pretty <laughs> tiny. It's wondering about your wife, you know. I mean, did her parents ask her not to get married to you? No, because <laughs> we Indians are like that, you know. I mean, we have to assess the risk management, like yeah. the, the girl's parents would really make sure. Yeah. That Check out the family, etc., etc. There's a guy, you know, he has to be after he has risk or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think my wife, wife's mom, her father has passed away already, but my wife's mom didn't speak to me for several months. She only speaks Gujarati. So, so uh, but she didn't even try to speak to me. And then she figured out that maybe I'm an okay guy and I learned a few words of Gujarati so I can converse with her a little bit and now she finds it pretty funny. So, uh, you know, people come around. Are, are you yeah. full-time doing this now? I'm doing full-time this for now. So, yeah, so I'm climbing, speaking a little bit, companies, etc. Until you figure out whether... Until I figure out what my next big thing is. So uh, you may have missed the beginning. So my background is I've done startups in the telecom space. So, um, you know, until I find the next good idea to pursue, then I'll, you know, explore the world a little bit. So there's a guy coming, I don't know if you're around, on the 10th of uh, November. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, executive, uh, the okay. largest real estate company in, in China is a banker. And he's coming to speak at LBS on the okay. 10th. And he climbed Everest twice. Oh, wow. And, and he's a complete, I mean, if you need money, sponsors, yeah. partners. Well, I'm already in Dubai back then, but it would have been nice to come. Uh, it would have been interesting. Yeah. Is this wow. part of the China Business Forum thing? Yeah. That's going up? Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, a guy from LBS, Lien, uh, who is a Singaporean living in Shanghai, uh, climbed with him once. Okay. There's a bunch of LBS people that climbed, I think, there's yeah. three or four, I think. Yeah. And he climbed it with this guy, and he, you know, he's one of the wealthiest guys in China. And he said, yeah. uh, you know, I can call him anytime. It's exactly what you said. The yeah. level of intimacy that you develop yeah. uh, goes beyond, you know, and he's not interested in the wealth or anything. It's just a, you know, a person that would actually challenge you in certain things in your life, and it's very interesting. Yeah. So. And, 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 it's, and it's interesting also in the sense that, you know, some of these relationships that you build on a mountain, like I said, I have now very close friends who are 60 years old. It would be very difficult in a normal work or other environment, life environment, to develop a close relationship with somebody who's in, in a totally different world than you are in. Uh, there's lawyers and, you know, policemen and firemen and businessmen, and there's a very different mix of people, teachers on the mountain. So you, you meet people from different walks of life and, and, and different industries, but everybody say, shares that same passion. So that's a very interesting uh, point to make, actually. But it's an in interesting character. This uh, sounds like this uh, Chinese fellow. Yeah, he's a crazy guy. I can, I can send you links to it. Oh, you, yeah, he's an interesting guy. I mean, any, anybody that does this kind of thing and is not a professional climber, yeah. a career climber, normally has, you know, either completely crazy or, yeah. or, or has some interesting stuff behind it. Uh, yeah. That's the most of the point. But, but there's lots of interesting people. I mean, there's a um, Norwegian guy called Erling Kege who uh, was the first person to complete what's known as the Three Poles Challenge. So he climbed Everest and reached both poles as the first person un unassisted by himself, skiing for two months in the middle of nowhere. Um, and he came back. He's Norwegian. He came back. People were super interested in his story, so he wrote a, wrote a book. And then he wrote a second book and a third book and a fourth book. And he was so popular, he sold hundreds of thousands of books or something, that he made enough money to buy a publishing company. And now he's a big publisher in Norway, which started out of this. And, and, uh, and he's turned, out, turned that into a career. So it depends, you know, it can lead you into interesting places and, 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 and so forth. But just to give you guys one last comment on, on, on Everest, unless you have more questions, I had, a, I had a teammate from California, which this is kind of a funny story that, that I'll leave you with. He's the, uh, he's a managing director of wealth management for one of the big investment banks in the world. And uh, he, he's a competitive triathlonist and uh, a triathlete, and he came to the mountain and admitted very quick, soon that he had one major concern about Everest. And everybody's got concerns about specific spots that we've read about or talk, talk to somebody about. And he said, it's about having to eat yak meat. <laughs> and you sort of look at the guy and go, did I, is it altitude or did I hear right? So your big concern about climbing Everest is the fact that you have to eat yak meat on the mountain. Okay, we'll play along with this. So what can we do about it? He said, no problems. I already, prob I already solved the problem. I found a hypnotist in California, and he cured me of this fear of having to eat yak meat. So, so I, I guess in some ways it is true that you know these kinds of places attract both the sane and the somewhat insane people. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Sorry, uh, just wanted to um, between climbing to Everest Base Camp and Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it seems like both of them are comparable altitude. But one, the base camp takes about, I think, 10, 10 days or mm -hmm. 12 days, and Kilimanjaro is about six, seven yeah. days. Uh, just want to get your opinions on one versus the other, and why is one kind of 12 days versus, yeah. is that? Can we just add to his question, which one is like, yeah. you know, easier to do? Ah, that's the wrong way to look at this. Yeah. Um, I, I, <coughs> yeah, I, I, w I would personally pick Kilimanjaro, and I'll explain to you why. Um, when you're climbing, it's difficult to explain it, but getting to the summit is a, is, a, is, a, is a special feeling. And if you climb to Everest Base Camp, you're not getting to a summit. You're getting to somewhere where the real climber, climbing starts in some way. So I think you might miss out on the kind of a feeling. And that's why many people who climb Everest Base Camp, they'll climb Kalapatar or one of these smaller peaks close by, but it's not quite the same. <coughs> on, on, uh, on on a trek to Everest Base Camp, you can sleep in 
little huts or little villages inside for the entire trip. Doesn't really give you the feeling of I'm in the outside and really pushing myself. So, but the base camp trek from Lukla, where you fly into, is about 65 kilometers. That's why, that's why it takes a little bit longer because the path is really like this. Um, unfortunately, we had some AV problems, so I couldn't use my own laptop. I I actually carried these military GPS locators with me that every few minutes sent my GP or captured my GPS coordinates and they've been mapped on a, on a map and they've done a fly through of it that shows the whole route. So if you're interested, I can send you a YouTube link. You can check it out and see exactly what the route looks like. <clears throat> but it's lots of going up and down. Um, it's kind of cool. You see interesting things on, on, uh, on uh, the Everest Base Camp trek. Obviously the scenery is stunning. But like I said, you don't get to a summit and you're staying indoors. Whereas on Kilimanjaro, it's proper climbing. You have to get there and once you get to the summit, I guarantee that you'll be a stronger and happier person for it when you realize that I'm standing on snow in middle of Africa, the savanna and all those animals are below me, etc. It's, it's an awesome feeling. Um, and, and, you know, strength-wise, I think it's Maybe Kilimanjaro is a little bit tougher, um, but you know they're both doable. Little bit of training, right approach. It's both are good, but I would do Kilimanjaro out of those two options. Yeah. And I was telling these guys earlier that many other business schools actually encourage students to go on mountain climbing trips. So Wharton, for example, has a program. I think they teach leadership or somewhere where a professor goes with students on a mountain and they go through, you know, leadership and what is it like in a, in a mountain environment or teamwork, etc. Harvard Business School uses an Everest simulation to teach people about decision making, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's quite an interesting environment and, and something that is rewarding both, you know, personally and, and business-wise uh, if you do that. And by the way, if you need, you can find me on sevensummits.fi, for example. So if anybody decides to climb a mountain today or later, you know, send me a message or I can give you my business card, etc. And I'll give you suggestions on companies you can contract with if you go to Kilimanjaro or suggestions on routes or equipment, etc. So I'll be happy to do that. Cool. That's it. Thank you, guys.